Okay, so this morning, once again, we'll be in, in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 18 through 29. And the title of the message this morning is The Corrupted Church. The Corrupted Church. And uh, before we get into a verse-by-verse study, let me go ahead and um, open up in another word of prayer this morning, and then we'll look at this um, together. Well, Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for this morning, Lord. We thank you for this, this wonderful time of worship we had, Lord. We thank you for the fellowship we had this morning. And um, we're just so grateful, Lord, that we can come together as brothers and sisters in the Lord together this morning and, and praise you, worship you, seek your face, Lord, through your word this morning. And once again, Lord, we pray that you fill this place with your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that you help me to decrease, Lord, and that you would increase, Lord, and that your word would just minister to us in the ways you desire to minister to us, Lord. We thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much for your patience and your mercy. And uh, we're just so excited, Lord, to be here and to hear from you this morning. We pray these things, we ask these things once again, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. And over the past uh, few times I've been up here, we've been going through the seven churches there in Asia Minor. And um, today we're going to look at the church of, um, um, what are we looking at today? (laughs) Thyatira, I'm sorry, Thyatira. I was going to say Pergamon, but that was the last time I was here. So Thyatira is what we're looking at this morning. But the thing this morning I want to talk about is corruption. And when you think about corruption and the world we're living in today, it's not too hard to find corruption, right? You think about our government, you think about our school system, you think about our healthcare system, you think about just anything in general. There's corruption everywhere. And one place you maybe wouldn't expect to see corruption would be maybe in the church. But unfortunately, corruption has made its way um, into the church in many, many different ways. And for example, we've talked about the church in um, Corinth. Remember, we've talked about the Corinthian church in many, many uh, sessions we've had up here before. But you think about the Corinthian church and how they were allowing sexual immorality. They were allowing lawsuits and all these other issues they were having. And there was corruption in that church. So throughout the history of the church, there's been corruption that has infiltrated um, the church. And today what we're going to see is that there is corruption in this particular church in Thyatira that has been accepted by the church there, and the Lord has to address this particular issue um, with that church. And when you think about the church and the corruption in the church, it's not because of the church building. It's not because of the Word of God. It's not because of the Holy Spirit. It's because of us. It's people. We mess up the church because we're messed up, right? Um, but by the grace of God, he's able to use us and, um, and help in these areas that we need to work on. And today what we're going to see is that this awful thing called corruption can lead to some serious um, consequences. So just a little bit of a background here. So far what we've talked about is the church there in Ephesus, that church that had left their first love. We talked about the church that was suffering in Smyrna. We've talked about the church that was compromising in Pergamum or Pergamos. And today we're going to focus on this corrupted church of Thyatira. And it's interesting because Thyatira was actually one of the smaller cities in that region of Asia Minor, but they actually had the longest letter written to them. And uh, we'll see why in just a little bit. But the city of Thyatira was actually located southeast of Pergamum, which is the last church we talked about. And it's actually located in modern day Turkey in the city of Akisar. Now, Thyatira means perpetual sacrifice or continual offering. And this was a place that was known as a military town and a commercial center. It had a lot of trading guilds that were located there. And when you think about like a trade guild, you can think of like masoners, weavers, leather workers, um, dyers, that type of thing. And each had their own patron deity from the Greek and Roman pantheon gods. So in other words, there was a lot of idolatry that was taking place in these trading guilds there in Thyatira. And Thyatira, in fact, was very famous for its manufacture of purple dye. And in fact, if you look in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16, verses 15 through 16, it tells us about a woman named Lydia. If you remember Lydia from Thyatira, and it says there during her conversion in Acts chapter 16, It says, a God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, was listening. 
the Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. After she had her household, after she and her household rather were baptized, she urged us, if you considered me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So there the Apostle Paul documenting this conversion of Lydia. But once again in the city of Thyatira, a trader or a dealer of the purple of purple cloth. And once again, because of all the trade and the business that was taking place there in Thyatira, there was a lot of idolatry and immorality that took place in the city. Two of the great enemies of the church then and two of the great enemies of the church now, idolatry and immorality. We have to be very careful. And we'll talk more about that as we go through the study here. But Thyatira had a special temple devoted to the sun god of Apollo, in addition to all those other things that were taking place. But what's interesting, and we'll see this in just a little bit, is that the Lord introduces himself here as the son of God, and probably because of the idolatry that was taking place here in uh, Thyatira. And in fact, this is the only place in the book of Revelation where he identifies himself in that manner, as the son of God. And what we'll see today through John, as he delivers this message um, from the Lord, is that there is a great warning and great judgment that was coming upon this church because of their um, acceptance of the idolatry and the immorality that was taking place in this particular church. And as, you know, I think for us as the church in this current church age that we're living in, we can certainly learn from all of this um, information that's provided to us. So before we actually look at the, the, the verses verse by verse, let me go ahead and read everything for the entire text. It's not very long, right? And we say it's not, you know, Psalm 119, so it's, it's not super, super long. Um, all right, so Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 18, this is the letter to Thyatira. The word of God tells us here, Write to the angel of the church in Thyatira, Thus says the Son of God, the one whose eyes are like a fiery flame, and whose feet are like fine bronze. I know your works, your love, faithfulness, service, and endurance. I know that your last works are greater than the first, but I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and teaches and deceives my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat meat sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to repent of her sexual immorality. Look, I will throw her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great affliction, unless they repent of her works. I will strike her children dead, then all the churches will know that I am the one who examines minds and hearts, and I will give to each of you according to your works. I say to you, I say to the rest of you rather in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who haven't known the so-called secrets of Satan, as they say, I am not putting any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works to the end, I will give him authority over the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. He will shatter them like pottery. Just as I have received this from my father, I will also give him the morning star." Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. So there we have that letter to the church in Thyatira. And what we're going to see as we go through this verse by verse is there's some wonderful things that have happened here, but there's also some, some things that need to be addressed in this particular church. Now, if you look in the very first verse, the first part of verse 18, it says, Write to the angel of the church in Thyatira. So once again, the Lord is addressing this particular church. And just as we saw with Ephesus, with Smyrna, and with Pergamum, he's addressing the angel there at that particular church. And as we mentioned before, that could be maybe a particular representative of the church, a leader in that particular church, or maybe a pastor in that church. Um, we don't know for sure, but he's addressing this specific church in Thyatira. But then if you look in the second part of verse 18, the Lord introduces himself, right? It says, thus says the son of God, the one whose eyes are like a fiery flame and whose feet like fine bronze. So notice once again that the Lord introduces himself as the son of God, really, really emphasizing his deity right off the bat here. And when you think about 
this kind of in a, in a, in a way like relating to us, you think about like a son or a daughter of, of anything, a person or even like an animal or, or whatever, um, typically the son or daughter of a person, we'll say a person, will typically have the nature of that particular person, right? It's their, their children. Um, in the animal kingdom, it would be their offspring. Now, remember what John tells us in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 9. There it says, remember, um, I'm sorry, I didn't actually didn't put the verse here, but I'll, I'll paraphrase it for you. Remember that Philip had asked Jesus, show us the Father, right? He had asked him to show the disciples the Father. And the Lord tells him, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we know from the beginning that the Lord himself had the divine nature of God the Father. So once again, hear the Lord declaring who he is, God the Son, right? We have God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was going to be very much like God the Father because he is God, but only in the form of the Son. But notice that the Lord then describes his eyes. And this is kind of interesting. You know, I, I've read in a number of articles that when you first meet somebody, the first thing you notice about them is either their teeth, their smile, or their eyes, okay? And um, it's interesting here because you see the Lord's eyes, right? They're, they're, fi they're eyes of uh, fiery flame. And that's something certainly you would never forget, right? If you saw a person with, with eyes like this. But here, once again, the Lord is describing his eyes and um, we notice these flames in his eyes. But if you look in the first chapter of Revelation, uh, John actually describes this to us again there. If you look there, here he gives us this description of the risen Lord. In Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, it says, Then I, this is John speaking, turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. When I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands, speaking of the churches, and among the lampstands was the one like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe and with a golden sash wrapped around his chest. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze, as it is fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand. A sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at full strength. So once again, his eyes of flame are described there as well in the first chapter of Revelation, and then here once again in the second chapter. But when you think about this, this truly emphasizes the idea of his eyes looking with penetrating um, judgment. And in fact, when you think about fire throughout scripture, typically it's associated with the Lord's judgment. And the eyes being described here as this fire flame in a sense kind of shows us that the Lord is judging everything. He sees everything. He's judging it. He knows everything. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But this kind of reminds me of what the Apostle Paul told the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you remember there. If you look there, beginning in the 12th verse, um, Paul is talking about the responsibility of the believer in building upon the foundation of the church. And in fact, if you look there in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 through 15, it says, If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So once again, what's being spoken of here is that bema seat or that judgment seat of Christ, where the believer is judged for their service unto the Lord, and they're rewarded with um, rewards beyond salvation. We talked about the crowns, those five crowns of, of reward before. But once again here, everything's going to pass through that fire of judgment, and here in the book of Revelation, we see the Lord's eyes being described as that fiery, um, that fiery flame, which I believe is him seeing everything and judging everything as, as we go about. So everything that, everything that we do for the Lord, um, he judges our motives, our hearts, our why. Everything that we do is judged by the Lord. And in fact, in Revelation twenty two twelve, he tells us, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. But notice too what is described here as his feet. 
And we saw this in that section there in Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. He describes his feet as fine bronze. And I believe in some other translations, it might say fine brass, perhaps. Um, But really what we want to take away from that description of these metals is the purity of the metal and also the strength of the metal, which I believe are both wonderful and accurate descriptions of the Lord himself. And certainly in the Lord, he is our strength. And we want to be holy and pure just like the Lord because that's the way he is. We want to be more like him. Now notice in verse 19 that the Lord shares what he knows about the believers there in Thyatira. And we know that the Lord is all-knowing. He knows everything. He judges everything. Everything will pass through the flame. He says in verse 19, I know your works, your love, faithfulness, service, and endurance. I know that your last works are greater than the first. So just as we saw with the other churches, like the one in Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamum, um, the Lord knows everything, and he judges everything. And as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, Thyatira was the least significant church in that whole region, but yet the Lord knew everything about them. Nothing was hidden from the Lord. And um, I think sometimes we, we think we can hide from the Lord. We make ourselves less noticeable, right? You know, I'll be a wallflower. I'll be invisible, you know, like I was in high school. But, um, but we can't. The Lord sees everything, right? He sees everything that we do. Maybe I'll sit in the back, be unnoticed. But God knows. He knew everything about Thyatira. He knew everything about Ephesus. He knows everything about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel too. And we have to be aware of that. The author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 4.13, No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom... We must give an account. So notice that the Lord mentions their love, their faithfulness, their service, and their endurance here in verse 19. And of course, we know all of those things are a result of the work of the Holy Spirit, right? If you look in Galatians chapter 5, 22, it tells us there, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and um, and self-control. So when you think about this church here in Thyatira, it certainly was a model church. Having love for the Lord, having love for each other, having faith and service unto the Lord and enduring. So they were were a great example. It was a beautiful thing to see this, this church in Thyatira. And I know for Pastor Angel and for myself as well, and hopefully for everyone here, these are things we would desire for our church to be fruitful, to love, to have faith, to have service, to have endurance. It's a wonderful thing. And then to sweeten the pot even more, the Lord says, I know that your last works are greater than the first. So not only that they have these wonderful things and works taking place there, but they were increasing in measure. These things were growing. And I love this because as believers, if we're not growing, we're going to become complacent. And then that's when compromise starts to come back into our lives. The truth of the matter is if we're not growing, We're kind of backsliding, I believe. We don't want to be lazy Christians. Don't ever be comfortable where you are in your walk. Always desire every single day to be closer to the Lord. I know that's easier said than done some some days, um, but my desire as a leader here um, and as your brother in Christ is every time we see each other to be closer to the Lord than we were the last time we saw each other because that's our heart is to be more like the Lord. We don't ever want to be comfortable and be prideful where we're at. Oh, I'm good. I'm comfortable. I'm good where I'm at with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, the Lord tells us there through Paul, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We need to be, excuse me, very, very careful. Now, the truth is all of us in this room are as close to God as we choose to be. I know people say this all the time, but that's true, right? We're as close to God as we choose to be. Now, the church there in Thyatira Once again, they have these really beautiful things, wonderful things taking place there. There was a lot of love there. There was faithfulness. There was service. There was endurance. But unfortunately, there were some issues that needed to be addressed. And we'll see this in the next section here in verses 20 through 21. If you look here, um, John writes for us. This is the Lord speaking through John. But I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and teaches and deceives my servants to commit sexual immorality 
and to eat meat sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, verse 21, but she does not want to repent of her sexual immorality. So no amount of loving, sacrificial works would excuse the tolerance of the wickedness and the evilness that was there in the church of Thyatira. And the big issue here was this woman named Jezebel. Now, this could have been her actual name, or this could have been a title that was given to her. And to call a woman Jezebel would be like to call a man Judas. It's an evil thing, right? It's a terrible thing. Now, if you remember Jezebel from the Old Testament, the beginning of the Bible, uh, remember she was the daughter of Ethbal, the priest of the false god Baal, remember? And if, if you remember there, he, the, her, her dad, uh, King Ethbal, murdered his own brother to take over the throne. So the, obviously there were some issues with those individuals. And the apple didn't fall too far from the tree. You see, Jezebel attempted to combine the worship of Israel with the worship of the false god or the idol Baal. And that was a problem. She didn't carry a very good record. But this woman here in the church of Thyatira, she represented apparently a self-styled prophetess within the church, probably after the pattern of Jezebel that we read about in the Old Testament. And her seductive teachings were very similar to those of Balaam. And if you remember the last time when we talked about the church of Pergamum, that church that was compromising, we talked about Balaam and his practices. You see, Jezebel led many in the church of Thyatira uh, to go astray by compromising with the Roman religion and the immoral practices that were taking place in the trading guilds. Remember that those guilds had their own patron deity from the Greek and Roman pantheon gods. So there was a lot of idolatry taking place in those trading guilds. And one scholar put it this way, the draw to the guilds and their meetings was powerful. No merchant or trader could hope to prosper or make money unless he was a member of his trade guild. So the immorality was necessary for survival economically in this place. So obviously people were engaged in this for their, for their, um, their livelihood, but unfortunately it was leading them astray and it was destroying their testimony in the Lord. So obviously this woman was not really a prophetess. She only claimed to be one. And remember that the Lord warns us regarding prophets and prophetess, right? Matthew 24, 11 says, Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And as believers, we need to be very careful. We have to test all prophets, all prophets don't we? Prophetess as well. If you look in the word of God, there's, there are things we have to be aware of. And we don't want to automatically denounce or despise prophecy, but we want to test it. And the first thing we need to do when it comes to prophecy, as we test it, number one, is a prophet must not contradict anything that God has previously recorded for us in the word of God or revealed to us. 1 John 4, 1 tells us, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Secondly, a prophet must exalt Jesus Christ. Revelation 19, 10 tells us, Worship God, because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Um, 1 John 4, verses 2 through 3 tells us, This is how you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming. Even now it is already in the world. Thirdly, a prophet's life must be consistent with the prophecy he or she reveals. Matthew 7, verses 15 through 16, it tells us, Be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So we'll know who they are by their fruit. And then fourthly, because someone meets these three criteria, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are messengers from God. And that's where the leaders of the church come in. In particular, assemblies, each should make their own decision and determination if individuals um, are prophets or prophetists. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 20 through 21 tells us, Don't despise prophecies, but test all things. 
Hold on to what is good. So once again, the prophecies should be tested, and if they are true, they should not be despised. But obviously, in the case of Thyatira, this woman, Jezebel, was a false prophetess. She was leading people astray. She was the one bringing corruption into the church, corruption that these individuals were accepting. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a little bit uh, when the Lord addresses that particular situation, that particular issue. Notice that she teaches and she deceives my servants, the Lord says, to commit sexual immorality and to eat meat sacrificed to idols. You see, this woman Jezebel was a deceiver. She deceived the Lord's servants, right? He says, my servants here in, in the text. And just like the enemy, right? The greatest deceiver, the great deceiver, right? He comes to just to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And this individual, this woman, Jezebel, was doing the same thing. The Lord tells us in Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall away, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. So her actions were causing many to stumble and also to go astray. And as we mentioned at the beginning, there was a, an abundance of these trading guilds there in Thyatira. So the immorality once again was likely associated with the social gatherings around these trading guilds. And this was the world that the people in Thyatira were, were living in. And this was the way that many of these individuals made their living. So they engaged in these activities. And unfortunately, we see this in our world today as well, right? There's a lot of corruption, immorality. There's a lot of ungodliness to make a quick buck, to uh, gain um, societal status, to be a friend with the world. So what's happening today in the world is nothing new under the sun, right? We've seen this before. Remember what the Lord tells us in James 4, 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? So whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes the enemy um, of God. So notice that the Lord in his graciousness and long suffering, verse 21, we really see the heart of the Lord there because he says, I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to repent of her sexual immorality. So in this verse, we see the Lord's mercy, right? He gave her time to repent, but we also see his judgment. He saw and he was aware of the fact that she didn't repent and she was still engaging in her old ways. And here we have the Lord's greatest accusation um, against this, this particular woman. She was given a chance to change her way. She was given a chance to repent, but she rejected the work of the Holy Spirit in her life and that call to repentance. It kind of reminded me of what the Lord um, mentions in Genesis chapter 3, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, where he says, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. You see, God gives us time to repent. And from my experience, I, I'm so grateful the Lord's been very patient with me. And I'm so glad he didn't take me from this earth before I came to know him personally. And he was very patient with me, and I'm so grateful for that. But there's not an unlimited time for God's judgment, before God's judgment, rather, is poured out upon us, right? And the time that God gives us to repent, we need to take advantage of that particular time. And today is the day of salvation, right? 2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 2, Paul tells us, We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain, for he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you, and in the day of salvation, I've helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We don't ever want to be in that situation as this woman was. We're not guaranteed tomorrow, right? God's patience with us will eventually run out. And what a terrible place to be as this woman was. And that, that's, that's a pretty heavy, heavy thing here. But I really believe the, heavy, the heavier part of this, this section is at the beginning of verse 20, where it says that Thyatira, the church itself, tolerated this woman Jezebel. They were tolerating her. They were allowing this into the church. And this is heavy because from the outside, this church looked like the model church. They had the love. They had the faithfulness. They had the endurance. They had the service. And it's interesting because when you compare Thyatira to the church in Ephesus, Ephesus, remember, had left their first love. They had lost their love for the Lord and for each other, but yet they did not allow 
the the um the evil works of the Nicolaitans and Balaam into their church, right? They hated those practices just like the Lord. But yet the church of Thyatira had the love, but they were allowing um, compromise into their church. So there needed to be a combination of, of these two things. We have to have the love for the Lord and for each other. We need to grow in service and in our endurance. But at the same time, we have to be bold and we have to call out um, wickedness and evilness that infiltrates the church. We have to be bold enough not to accept it and to push it out. And we don't see this though with Thyatira. And we want, we want the best of both of those churches, Ephesus and Thyatira. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, but clearly the church of Thyatira needed to work on this. And the Lord will, will help them in just a little bit. He'll give them some, some, um, some guidance on that. But this church had some significant corruption taking place. And this was corruption that they allowed. And the word of God tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made visible. For what makes everything visible is light. So by allowing this in the church, in a sense, they were participating in these acts as well. It only takes a few to corrupt the whole church, doesn't it? Galatians 5.9 tells us a little leaven leavens the whole, um, the whole batch. We need to be very careful. We need to be very mindful. And the only way we can, we can identify these things is to be in constant fellowship with the Lord, growing in the Lord, and, and taking care of the Lord's sheep as we grow in the Lord together. In verse 22, 23, 24, and 25, the Lord commands the church of Thyatira um, to do something specifically. It says, beginning in verse 22, he says, Look, I will throw her, speaking of Jezebel, into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great affliction, unless they repent of her works. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who examines minds and hearts, and I will give to each of you according to your works. I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who haven't known the so-called secrets of Satan, as they say, I am not putting any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. So this is interesting because what we see here is the Lord first tells the believers there the consequences of what will happen before he tells them what they need to do. And um, I don't know if this ever happened to you growing up, but I remember my parents did this to me sometimes. They would tell me the consequences first before what I needed to do, right? Like, I'm going to kill you if you don't clean this room, you know? And, you know, if parents tell you they're going to kill you, but they really never do. Now, you may have had maybe some near-death experiences with your parents, but they never really kill you. Um, but this is what the Lord does, because the Lord chastens those he loves, right? And he's doing this here. But notice that the consequences that this woman would face would be this, right? He would throw her into a sick bed, um, and those who commit adultery with her into great affliction, so there would be some punishment for them. So it's important to understand that adultery, sexual adultery, um, is, is not just sexual adultery. It's also spiritual adultery that we're committing when we engage in these particular actions. And we need to be very careful. Um, idolatry, remember, is, is, is compromise. And what we're doing when we, when we commit idolatry or spiritual adultery is um, we're, we're kind of breaking those marriage vows that we've made onto the Lord. And we've got to be very careful with that. We have to hold that sacred because it's sacred. And when you think about this sickbed, you can think of this image of affliction or maybe it could indicate that this was an actual sickness that she would fall into. And sometimes the Lord can use illness to rebuke and to chasten, okay? Now, if you're sick in body this morning, which I think it's a lot of us, you know, um, we all have our own issues, you know, the Lord is not necessarily chastening you or it's because you're in sin. I mean, we're all sinners, right? Um, however, throughout the history in the Bible, he has used illness to chasten and to wake up people, right? And I believe this is what he's speaking of here because he's given her so many, so many opportunities. But remember what Paul told the Corinthians, because this happened to the Corinthians, if you remember in the first letter in chapter 11, uh, remember they were partaking of the Lord's table in an unworthy way. And he told them in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty through 32, this is why many are sick and ill among you and many have fallen asleep. If you were properly judging yourselves, we would not be judged. 
But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. And there, obviously, the Lord was, was using illness to, to wake up these individuals there in the church of Corinth that obviously had a lot of issues. There was a lot of corruption there, too, um, because of their misuse or their, their, um, their lack of self-examination at the communion table. But illness can be used in other ways, too. I know in my life, it's used me to draw me closer to the Lord and help me grow in my walk. And I think a lot of us can attest to that. Um, so that, that's what I want to clear up. I'm not suggesting, you know, you're sick this morning because the Lord's chastening you, but he can use it to chasten. Um, but notice he always makes a way. He says, unless they repent of their works, right, is what he says. And this is a reason for the chastening. He wants them to get right with him. When you think about the work of the Lord and the church, you know, it's all about restoration. That's what we want. We want restoration. You know, none of us are better than each other. We're all sinners and we want restoration. That's what we want. Um, and that's what the Lord wants. That none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, because they didn't listen before, Perhaps this would get their attention. But then notice he says, then all the churches will know that I am the one who examines minds and hearts, and I will give to each of you according um, to your works. So obviously this would show the other churches the sovereignty of the Lord and the fact that there were consequences associated with everything that they did as he judged everything, right? With his eyes of fiery flame. But notice that the Lord also addresses the faithful ones there in Thyatira. Um, he says, I say to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, okay, those that were not following this woman Jezebel and her teachings, who haven't known the so-called secrets of Satan, as they say, I am not putting any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. So he tells them simply to hold fast until he comes. And what he's talking about there is referring to his return for his people. And at that point, he will reward them for their faithfulness unto him. And it's interesting because what he's talking about here is actually the rapture of the church. It's not referring to his second coming where he physically is on this planet, but rather the rapture. And in fact, this is the only place, or the, uh, yeah, the first place and probably the only place we see this where he mentions the rapture here in the book of Revelation. This is the first time he mentions it. And in fact, Pastor Angel talked a lot about this in 1 Thessalonians. So if you want to go back and listen to that study regarding the rapture of the church, you can do that in that fourth chapter. Those videos are archived. But, um, but this event um, is not the Lord's second coming, as I mentioned before, but rather this is a time when the church is raptured or caught up um, and removed from the earth right before that great tribulation period takes place. And just like the believers in Thyatira we also need to be holding fast until, um, until the Lord comes. The author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 10, verse 23 through 25, let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful, and let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day um, approaching. So that's what we're supposed to do until the Lord comes back. But then notice here in this verse, it says, those who haven't thrown, haven't known rather, the so-called secrets of Satan, as they say. So what does he mean by that when he says that here? You know, it's interesting because if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, there's actually a verse there that's kind of like the complete opposite of this verse. It's like a contrast to this verse. If you look in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10, it says, Now God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit, since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. So this verse in 1 Corinthians 2, 10, which is a contrast or complete opposite to this verse here in Revelation, is basically telling us that the Holy Spirit and his infinite wisdom and his infinite knowledge reveals and knows the truth of God and is able to impart those to others, including us as believers. But in the case of Jezebel, what she was doing is she was discovering and representing the depths of Satan to the individuals that she was leading astray. So the complete opposite. So obviously this woman was a false um, prophet prophetess. She was doing the, the works of evil and not the works of the Lord. Obviously, this is not through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. And 
Unfortunately, she was able to deceive, deceive rather believers and disease believers as well because the wages of sin is death. Um, and we got to be careful with that because it's easy to be deceived if we're not holding fast to the Lord. Now, if you look in verse 26, 27, and 28, what we see is that there's going to be a reward and a promise to those that are holding fast to the Lord. Verse 26 says, The one who conquers and who keeps my works to the end, I will give him authority over the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. He will shatter them like pottery. Just as I have received this from my father, I will also give him the morning star. So just because you find yourself in a bad environment um, doesn't mean you have to give in into that environment and live like that particular environment or that way of living, right? We've seen this um, before. We've talked about this before. First Peter 1.16 tells us, For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. And the Lord is holy. We want to be more like the Lord. First Peter 5.8, Be sober-minded. Be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. So in the case of this immoral and adulterous uh, woman, Jezebel, one could overcome by simply keeping to the Lord's work and the Lord's word until the end. And I know that's easier said than done, right? Because that's what we're trying to do every single day as we live in this world. We're not of it, but we're in it. First John 5, 5 says, who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believed that Jesus is the son of of God, and certainly in the Lord, we can overcome anything, even this world that we're living in. And this is the same for those believers there in Thyatira in that particular time. But notice that he tells them that he would give them authority over the nations. So what does this really mean? Well, remember the Lord had promised that his people would rule with him. They would reign with him, right? When you think about, for example, the millennial reign, which is what is being spoken of here, he will rule with an iron scepter is what it says, and he will shatter them like pottery. And when you think about that time, that millennial reign, um, this is a time where holiness and righteousness um, will be enforced on this planet. And those that do not comply will be shattered to pieces like pottery. And in fact, this is actually mentioned in the Psalms as well. If you look in Psalm chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, there it tells us regarding the Lord himself, I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them in, with an iron scepter. You will shatter them with pottery. And what a, what a powerful image there. Have you guys ever shattered a terracotta pot before? I dropped one the other day. So you can't glue that thing back together. But that's a pretty powerful image there. The Lord and his power and his authority shattering the nations like pottery, right? Um... And even though this sounds aggressive, I think it's a, it's a pretty hopeful thing for us and for them in that time um, as believers, even in that time of idolatry and immorality, that there's hope and there's, there's a future in the midst of all of that so that they're not so discouraged. So if you're discouraged because of the world around us today, don't be so discouraged because these are, these are things we expect. These are not things that should surprise us. Things are going to get bad before they get better, right? We're on Team Jesus, and we know how it ends. We've read the book, right? We know how this all ends. We win at the end. So we got to hold fast to the Lord. But then notice he also offers them a great reward, right? He says, I will also give him the morning star. Now, what is this morning star? You know, it's funny because when, 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 I, when I first heard morning star, this was a while back, it, it kind of reminded me of, um, you know, like those vegetable patties, the morning star burgers? Yeah, if you haven't had one of those, you're not missing much. But um, that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about here is the Lord himself. If you look in Revelation 22, verse 16, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. And what a beautiful and perfect gift, the Lord himself. That would be the reward. And... This promise also kind of tells us that God's people, believers, will be closely identified um, with the Lord. And how cool is that? You know, the best is still yet to come. I'm really looking forward to that. And, and that's why as believers, we got to keep looking up, even in this world that we're living in, the discouragement, the, the darkness, everything. We have so much to look forward to. And then notice in the very last verse, he ends with a general exhortation to all who will hear. 
He says, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So this letter is for the faithful. This letter is for people like Jezebel. This letter is for followers of Jezebel. And this letter is also for followers that have allowed the compromise of Jezebel into the church. So basically, this letter that we've read is for everybody. It's for everyone. And you see, the dangers that we've looked at so far, for example, in the church of Ephesus, the church of Smyrna, the church of Pergamum, and then this morning in the church of Thyatira, all of those threats, all of those dangers are still threats and dangers to the church today. And we need to be watchful. The Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 16, he says, Pay careful attention then to how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise making the most of the time because the days um, are evil. So in closing this morning, I know there was a lot of information in this letter to this, what we thought was an insignificant church there in Asia Minor, but very significant to the Lord as all of us are. So if you ever think you're insignificant, you're not. You're extremely significant and valuable to the Lord. But what we saw this morning was the idea, the topic of corruption. And when you think about corruption, once again, this is something that we see in the world. We expect from the world. We expect from politics. We expect from, you know, institutions and individuals. But one would never expect to see corruption in the church. But unfortunately, throughout the history of the church, there's been a lot of corruption that's taken place. The enemy has been able to infiltrate the church using individuals with evil intentions and also, unfortunately, individuals in the church that have been um, deceived. And we as believers, we have to expose those things. That way they don't spread, you know, like a forest fire. We got to keep those things under control. Um, of course, the only way we can do that is being in fellowship and in close communication uh, with the Lord. So there's a couple of things I want us to take away from the church here in Thyatira. There's only four of them um, as we're closing this morning. Number one, just like the church in Thyatira, we want to continue growing in our love, our faithfulness, our service, and our endurance to the Lord. Okay, so I think those are things that we can learn from them, and we want to grow in those things. We don't want to be like the church in Ephesus that left their first love, but rather we want to draw nearer to Him. That way we can grow in those four areas in our lives. Secondly, we don't want to be tolerant of the infiltration of immoral things, um, compromise, and corruption into the church, just like we saw with Pergamum, and we saw this morning with Thyatira. And we know the church of Thyatira, they had the love, they just allowed immorality. The church in Ephesus didn't have the love, but they didn't allow the immorality. So having a combination of those two churches, the best of those two churches, is what we want to have. We want to have the love for the Lord for each other. We want to be growing in our faith and our service. But at the same time, we want to be mindful and we want to call out the infiltration of compromise and wickedness into the church. We've got to have that balance. Because when we don't do that, we can grieve and we can quench the Lord, right? We quench and we grieve the Holy Spirit. And then when we do that, we invite His righteous judgment into our lives, just like we saw with Jezebel and her unrepentant followers. And that's, pretty, that's an awful place to be. When we gradually kind of get away from our faith, we leave our faith, we lose our witness for Christ because of the world around us and we're influenced by it. We never want to be in that position. We don't ever want to give anyone the opportunity to blaspheme in the name of the Lord because of our behavior. We want to make sure that um, we're, we're walking with the Lord, representing the Lord everywhere we go. Thirdly, we need to remember that God's patience with us is not going to last forever. Revelation 2 verse 5, remember he, he wrote this um, there to the church in, um, in uh, Ephesus. He says, remember then how far you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, it will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place um, unless you repent. What an awful thing to have your lampstand removed. Um, and certainly we can learn from Jezebel and her refusal to repent because that leads to some serious consequences. We never, ever want to take advantage of God's grace. Fourthly and lastly, we need to hold fast to our faith. We need to walk in it until the Lord's return and then we will be rewarded. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 tells us, let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering since he who promised is faithful and let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. And then also we need to stay busy in the Lord, right? In order to be, to be holding fast to our faith. 
Revelation 22, 12, the Lord tells us, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. A.W. Tozer once said, The church that is not jealously protected by mighty intercession and sacrificial labors will before long become the abode of every evil bird and the hiding place of unsuspected corruption. The creeping wilderness will soon take over that church that trusts his own strength and forgets to watch and pray. And then finally, the Lord, and I'll close with this, I promise, the Lord reminds us in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 8, he says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will, will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting love. So let us continue walking steadfastly in the Lord, growing in the Lord, and exposing the corruption when it seeps into the church. Amen? Well, if it's your first time visiting the church, maybe you're watching via the live stream, or maybe you're here in person, and, and maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we want to give you that opportunity this morning. And um, I don't know where you've been. The Lord does. And maybe this morning you're tired of the corruption. You're tired of the, the compromise. You're just tired of the world around you and just the dissatisfaction that you, you, you see with the world. Because the world will never fill the void in our hearts that can only be filled with a relationship with Jesus Christ. We want to give you that opportunity that, that this morning, if you're here in person or if you're watching on the live stream. And if that's you this morning, I just want to invite you um, to close your eyes, bow your head, and uh, just repeat this prayer after me. But you have to say this wholeheartedly. This has to be with all your heart. This can't just be lip service unto the Lord. This is a real deal. You're inviting Him into your life to be your Lord and your Savior. So if this, that's you this morning, um, please, uh, you can repeat this prayer after me. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, Lord. And Lord, this morning, I want to, I want to declare your Son, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior. Lord, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that Jesus was buried and that he rose from the dead three days later. I know that I'm a sinner. Lord, please forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Change me. Use me for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that this morning, if you're watching on the live stream or maybe even here in person, we want to welcome you to the family of Christ. The Word of God tells us when even one person repents, there's a celebration in heaven. So if that was you, they're celebrating on your behalf, and we're celebrating too as well. And um, if you want more information maybe about the church, you want to learn more about your next steps, maybe you need a Bible, you need prayer, anything like that, let us know. You can reach out to the church. We meet every Sunday at 10 a.m. Our building is at 4242 Hondo Pass. We're right at the intersection of Hondo Pass and Gateway South in Suite uh, 101. Um, we're going to be praying for you, and um, we love you, and we hope to see you again uh, very soon here. So bye for now.